Um, I'm, I'm, I always feel a bit overawed by the, the knowledge that I'm surrounded by on the committee and um, particularly on all things to do with the history of Bromsgrove. But I, I think on Big Bertha, Berth, I, I am lucky. I do happen to know a fair bit about this engine. Um, my background is that I was born and brought up in, uh, in Warsaw, just north of um, Birmingham, but my dad was a railway enthusiast. And uh, he used to uh, bring me down to the Licky Incline to train spot. This was, of course, way after uh, Big Bertha was running. And so I got to be really excited about the incline. There, there was still lots of um, banking going on. I'll explain that, what that means to everybody in a few minutes. Um, but uh, I got really interested. I started to read up about the, the particular the steam age. And then I came across Big Bertha and I, I've kind of been in, in touch with her in a way, if you like, for the last uh, sort of 40, 50 years since I was a little boy, which uh, I feel very, very close to her. Um, so in 2006, on the 50th anniversary, I um, approached the society and we decided we put on a, um, uh, a joint exhibition, um, which we held at the at Dennis Norton's um, museum, at the Bromsgrove Museum there uh, in Bromsgrove. Um, and we had sort of physical photographs and things which I'd, I'd acquired from a, a gentleman called uh, Keith Parker, um, who I unfortunately have since lost touch with, rather unfortunately, I'll, I'll explain why a little bit later on. But his father was a, a very keen um, engineer and railway enthusiast, and uh, he studied Big Bertha in a, in a great amount of detail, recorded all the, all the physical dimensions, the, the, the thickness of a boilerplate and thickness of a, of a of the uh, chassis and all the components. And uh, he wrote um, a very uh, authoritative article for the Stevenson Locomotive Society. <clears throat> so there's quite a lot of information on that has, has found its way into many of the books that, uh, that you might read about the railway and Big Bertha. So I'm very pleased today to be talking to you now about Big Bertha. I'm gonna take you on a journey and uh, I hope you enjoy uh, taking this journey with me. So here we go, let's meet Big Bertha. So, um, First up, the, uh, the Licky Incline spent its, um, its early days, was, was originally built by the Birmingham and Gloucester Railway, as you know. In fact, in the early days of the railways, in the 1830s, there were literally thousands of railway companies that were all formed around small portions of track to, tra to take uh, goods and freight between towns. And uh, gradually, exactly as we see in the, in the world of commerce today, uh, amalgamations took place, acquisitions took place, and, um, the, the, one of the largest railway companies, the Midland Railway Company, ultimately acquired the Birmingham and Gloucester line and was uh, the main operator of that line from about the 1850s, 60s, right through to um, grouping in 1924. In 1924, um, all of the railways in Britain were grouped into four different companies and uh, the, mid, the uh, Licky Incline uh, initially ended up with the London, Midland and Scottish Railway. So you'll see that uh, the, uh, the, the tender letters will change at some point from Midland to LMS. And then in 1948, um, the railway network was nationalised and we ended up with British Railways. And initially, the Midland, the Licking Incline was run by um, the Midland region, the British Railways. But in later years, and that was around the time that uh, Big Bertha uh, demise, um, the Western region took over and... Um, and uh, things didn't, didn't go well for Midland Railway engines from then on <laughs> um, at all. So for those of you the Western enthusiasts, I'm not, I love the Great Western as well. So please don't, don't hate me for saying that. So the, um, you can see there the network that the uh, Midland Railway had, London up to, up to Carlisle, and then uh, railways branching out to the left, but always the center of the Midland Railway system was Derby. And uh, Derby was a major locomotive works. And, uh, and that is where Big Bertha of course was built ultimately. So if we just look at the, some of the early history of, uh, of the railway, this is a very early um, drawing, probably done in the in, in 1840, the, the incline opened in 1840. And um, you can see there as a, as a, a Norris engine, I think they were called, uh, pull, pulling up a, a, a very short coal train uh, up the incline. A lot of that infrastructure that we know and love today about the incline is still there. So including a lot of the bridges, um, I'm, I'm quite interested in the bridge structures as well, to be honest, because some of them are, date back right to the, the start of the railway line, which so they ought to be listed in their own right, I always think. But you can see here the um, very rudimentary system there of, of, of the track work. And of course, uh, over the years that developed. But all, this incline was the steepest inclined plane on uh, adhesion works plane on any railway line in, in Britain at the time and still is. It's, uh, it's one in 37.7 gradient and it's two miles and 10 chains long from, uh, from its lowest point to its highest point. 
and that is one hell of a drag and large trains are certainly in the early days the locomotive on the front was not strong enough to pull uh, all of the all of those um, coaches or wagons up the incline and so the concept of, uh, of banking came in which is basically uh, you have a loco at the front pulling the train and then another loco comes in at the back of the train and gives some gives a push if you like and pushes it up the bank and of course as the trains got increasingly longer and heavier because it was more economical to uh, move larger tonnages of either coal or freight and then obviously passenger trains as well the, the, the banking engines themselves had to get bigger and bigger to push these things up. And um, so ultimately the need for a really large locomotive came about. Now the, um, the Licky and Clyde, so initially those Norris engines like you see there uh, pulling the train up there were also used for banking. Um, and then ultimately uh, the Midland Railway started to introduce other locomotives um, designed by Kirtley for, for instance, and then Johnson later on. And, um, but they were always smaller engines because the Midland Railway had that concept of a small engine policy, which I'm going to demonstrate to you now. So here is the, uh, the Midland Railway as we know and love it in, in all of its uh, elegance. So you've got a, a Midland Railway spinner. Um, the, the wheel arrangement there is a 422, so it's four bogey wheels, two driving wheels, and then two pony wheels to take the weight. Um, pulling um, some period cholesterol and elliptical roof coaches uh, always be beautifully appointed. The Midland Railway was really known for its plushness and was, a, was a, a really comfortable way to travel. But you can imagine a locomotive like that would not be that powerful. So um, the Midland Railway ultimately had to start using more and more engines on the front of its trains. Here's a typical goods engine. Again, you see it's, a, it's an 060, so six driving wheels. Um, another another 060 there, and then we have a. This is this is one of the Midland Railway's really successful locomotives, the 440, four bogey wheels, four driving wheels. A very successful wheel arrangement for the Midland Railway. Um, and what happened ultimately on the express trains and the freight trains, you would find you would have two of these at the front, and then you might have um, two or even three of these locomotives on the back pushing behind. So you can imagine this, for running something, it's really inefficient. You've got two locomotives, two crews on the front two or three locomotives at the back with three, two or three crews. In terms of manning, really expensive, really inefficient. So you can see that the need for a more efficient way of operating was, was definitely needed. I, I just wanted to show one of the Kirtley. These are called Kirtley double framers, um, really archaic looking things, but they're actually built until quite late into the Victorian times because um, they were a very successful design uh, in terms of what they were able to do. But again, they would have been the main staple for pulling coal trains up the Dickie Incline. With, um, with similar engines pushing at the back. So why, why did Big Bertha come about? Well, the first thing is, I'm probably doing this out of sequence, why, why Big Bertha? That's an interesting thought. So today, um, we know Big Bertha as, as a name applied to many things. We've already heard a quick reference there from one of the people talking before we started. So it's very well known as a golf club. Um, I was actually going to include a picture of one, but I, I didn't add it in the end. So, um, so it's, it's a you know a fairly fairly hefty driver, I think. I'm not, I'm not a golfer, but uh, um, but plenty of weight, plenty of punch. That's why it tends to be called a, go a big Bertha. Apparently, a big Bertha is also a wrestler. I didn't know that. Um, it's also a vegetable. Uh, in the Q and A, perhaps somebody might tell me what the vegetable might be that might be nicknamed a big Bertha. That would be interesting. Um, this is a bit controversial because uh, we're not supposed to do this sort of thing now, but it was a notoriously large lady. <laughs> I've actually found some photographs, uh, but I, I definitely wasn't going to use those. Um, now, the, the real reference to Big Bertha in terms of the locomotive, of course, was, um, was the gun. And I'm going to come on to that in a minute. So the Big Bertha gun, which you've already heard mentioned, which is a big German piece of kit. And ultimately today, we're going to be talking about the steam engine that became fondly known as Big Bertha. It actually had other nicknames. It was often known as Big Emma or Big Liz, um, but the crews apparently used to call it just the Big Un, uh, as you'd expect good Brummies <laughs> to say. I can just hear that coming out now. Beautiful. So um, there are all sorts of versions of a ber Big Bertha gun, okay? Um, the, the main manufacturer of arms for Germany in the war was, was the Krupp factory. And, um, and, it, and it was actually headed by a lady called Bertha Krupp, hence B 
big Bertha. And towards the, um, the middle, towards the end of the First World War, um, as, as, as technology was developing, the guns became ever more and more powerful. And this gun, which I presume is probably a howitzer, I don't know, I'm not, a, not an, an armors expert. Uh, this particular one is the one that seems to be credited with being called Big Bertha, from what I can see. But there are also large, there's a rail, large rail mounted gun um, that emerged in the Second World War that also got called Big Bertha. But of course, that was a big, uh, our steam engine was already uh, performing sterling work on the Lincoln Incline before that was created. And there are some other large guns which I found, but this one seems to be the one that, that most often gets referred to as Big Bertha. So why is that significant to the Midland Railway? Well, I've just said to you that um, the Midland Railway had a small engine policy. So most of their engines were either 060s or 440s. Uh, they had a little dalliance with some American engines. They were 260s at one time. Um, but, but ultimately, they, they were committed to small engines. So when this concept of a large banking engine came around, which was way bigger than anything the Midland Railway had ever created, or the London Northwestern, or the, the other big competitors for that matter, uh, the only thing that came close at the time was, was a big locomotive produced by the Great Eastern Railway for, for shunting uh, in and around the London docks. But uh, so Big Bertha was a large engine, and so it was not surprising that at the end of the war, when this came along, the obvious thing was to do was to nickname it Big Bertha after this uh, frightening gun that the Germans had been using to fight us with. So yeah, the Bertha House. So um, there's the other other gun that is supposedly nicknamed Big Bertha, but I, I the provenance seems to be with the howitzer. And there's um, a photograph of, uh, of Bertha Krupp. So mother of a gun, bit of a bit of a pun there. But, uh, <laughs> I'm not responsible for that photograph. I think that is from a newspaper. So, so how did Big Bertha come about? So um, in, the, in the 1900s, um, Midland Railway, the directors and the engineers were already getting a bit fret, fretful about the, the fact that they were having to use so many locomotives to get over this incline. Um, so they started to think about a larger engine to actually push things up the incline. And some of these concepts that you're looking at here came around in bit, about 1910, I think. So these are, they look surprisingly modern to me, actually. These are, these are the genuine blueprints that I uh, borrowed from the National Rail Museum back in 2006 um, and have since had laminated and, uh, and, and kept close to my heart. So you see the first one there above there is a, is a two, a two, uh, two ten o, so two bogey wheels, 10 driving wheels, and it's a tank engine. So it doesn't actually have a tender or a coal space at the rear. Uh, and I gather the problem with that one, it was a two cylinder design. So it was ultimately it was deemed not powerful enough uh, in the design office. And then we see the derivation of that into a, an 080, so sorry, an 010, so no, no pony and no, um, no uh, bogey wheels, and, or just 10 driving wheels on five axles, as you can see there. And again, it's a tank engine design. And apparently, according to what I've read, there were another four or five concepts that uh, the Midland Railway produced over time. Um, but the one that grew, drew favour in the end was the one that we've grown to know and love, which was a, a tender engine uh, sitting on 10 driving wheels, but with four steam cylinders at the front. So you can see in that little section on the left hand side. Sorry for those of you that might not be used to looking at, at engineering drawings. These are these are schematics, if you like, um, but hopefully you'll see uh, around the middle part of that left-hand picture, you can see there's, there's two vertical um, circles there, and that's, that's the outside cylinders, and then you've got the two inner cylinders, and the steam chests are the top two, and the steam chests drove all four of the um, of the cylinders that were there, and apparently that was one of its one of its flaws. Apparently, it wasn't. It would have been more efficient if all of the uh, cylinders could have had their own individual steam chest. So the actual casting, which we're going to have a look at in a minute, for the cylinders was was really complicated for its time, and it was so complicated and and uh, innovative that um, when the locomotive was withdrawn, it was thought that the cylinders were going to be preserved because they were they were such a fantastic illustration of engineering uh, in the early parts of the 20th century. Um, the tender that you can see there uh, to the engine is uh, is not what it ended up looking like. That's my dog playing with the plug. Can I just, <laughs> excuse me? Um, bear with me. This is the joys of presenting from home. Two seconds. There we go. You've just met Daisy. Uh, who's 16 nearly and still behaves like a puppy so so she can leave the plug alone now 
<laughs> okay, so as you're going to see in a minute, when I start showing the photographs, the, the locomotive itself ended up with a different tender, to, as you can see in this, this arrangement here. Um, but there we go, you can see that must have been quite um, impressive coming off the Derby design office um, and, and to people who are used to the smaller engines that had been built up till then. So here we go. So this is Big Bertha emerging. Uh, these are photographs from the Alastair Rail Museum uh, and from the archive. And uh, hopefully that's a little bit clearer to you now. So you've got the locomotive during being constructed. It's sitting on um, on the on stands. It hasn't yet to have its wheels fitted there, as you can see. So you can see the chassis running underneath. And uh, you can probably see where the wheels are going to go eventually. And the really important part of this locomotive is those is that set of cylinders. So on the outside, you'll see those the two ones I referred to. The top one is the steam chest. That's what admits the steam into the cylinders to push the piston forward that eventually drives the wheels. And then the middle two um, circles that you can see underneath the uh, boiler, those are the inside cylinders. And as I said, they were they were steam powered from from the overall casting rather than having their own dedicated um, chamber. Um, Boiler on there, as you can see, fitted. Uh, I've got a, excuse me, I've got a photograph of the boiler, which you can see in a minute. On the right hand side, you might be interested to see that there are all the wheels. There are um, eight, uh, 10 wheels, five axles. And I'm going to point out an interesting feature here. I don't know whether you'll be able to see my mouse here. So there's the, there's the leading axle, as it were called, and that would have been going just there. Between. Now the next axle is really interesting because you'll notice it's cranked, so it's got two little steps in it. Now that is not to drive any valve gear, so I'll come back to that in a minute. The next axle uh, you can see um, has got the larger counterweights there, and that that is the uh, where the con rods for the in the connecting rods for the inside cylinders connect onto the axles there. So those are the cranks, and that's that enables the con rod to push the wheel around. Now. For, in order for the inside connecting rods to get their way to this middle axle here, they had to pass over the second axle in. And unfortunately, because of the way they were fitted, they would have fouled the actual axle itself. So these little cranks are actually to enable the con rod when it's pushing at the bottom of the um, of the of the uh, of the uh, of the crank on, on the main driving wheel to actually clear the axle. So that's all it's there for. I didn't actually realize this actually until I started doing this presentation. And I'd always seen that, and I thought it just drove some valve gear, but uh, so that's fascinating. That's marvelous engineering. So um, that's the kind of engineering you'd expect on an airplane. That's that kind of those min min minute tolerances so that it enabled it to work. And that served it well for the whole of its life. I don't think that particularly ever caused it a problem. Um, it had other problems, but uh, certainly that wasn't one of them. Next picture down is um, a picture of the locomotive now assembled. So as you can see, the wheels are now in place. Um, the boiler has got some, some lagging on it now. So what, what happens with the boilers, by the way, as you'll see later, is they are, they're made of, 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 of rolled steel. Um, and then obviously they're holding hot, hot water and steam. So without any insulation on, that would cool down very, very quickly and the locomotive wouldn't be efficient. So um, instead, we, we all locomotives, steam locomotives, whenever you go and see them on the seven mile railway, they all have what's called cladding around them and insulation uh, to, to stop the, uh, the boiler losing heat. And a couple of features there for you. This is the smoke box. This is where, actually, I'll start at the other end. This is the fire box. This is where the fire is, is created. That, uh, um, creates the heat that then passes through a number of tubes that pass through the boiler. And this is the boiler, and this is full of water, as is all of the area around where the firebox is. So you have a, what's called an outer and an inner firebox. So the fire is inside the inner firebox. There's then a jacket of water around it, which gets hot. And then you've got what's called the outer firebox. And then, of course, you've got the cladding on the top of it. And then the front end, we have the uh, smoke box. So this is where all the hot gases, the flue gases, um, go through and they go up the chimney. The key thing that happens, though, is that there's a, the, um, the two things have to happen. The, um, first of all, steam is admitted from the dome into the cylinders. These are these massive cylinders here through pipe work that's, that's contained within the, um, within the smoke box feeds through into the big cylinder block and then it's exhausted. So once it's pushed the cylinder back and the wheel comes around, it's then pushed back out. And that blast from the, um, the steam, the, the exhaust steam up through the chimney creates a vacuum in the, uh, in the smoke box, which helps draw the fire. So those of you that might remember all those years ago when the fire wouldn't light used to, I remember my dad putting newspaper across the front of it to try and get it to, to light, to draw the fire. And then when you drew it, you always used to suck all the paper in and straight up the chimney. That's a kind of a very crude <laughs> illustration of what happens here. 
So uh, without getting too technical, that's, um, that's big versus sort of anatomy, if you like. I'm going to point something else out here as well, which we'll come back to a bit later on, and that's just notice the shape of the front part of the frame. So these, these are the engine frames, which extend all the way through here. And just remember what that looks like, because that's going to change a little bit later on in the engine's life. So here's a, a picture of the, of the cylinder casting here. This is on the, um, this is on the uh, drive side, if you like. And this is where the, uh, connect it, the, um, the piston um, and the slide bar goes through here, um, which then eventually connects to the conrod and drives the wheels. Um, so that's the, um, that's the, uh, uh, the driving part of you like, and, there, and that's, this, that's the, uh, the steam chest over top. So the steam from the boiler initially goes into here. Um, it's, in, it's admitted through a valve arrangement into the cylinder to push the wheel, push the wheels forward, and then it's exhausted back through the chamber and up through the, through the chimney. And, and there's a, there are the inside cylinders. Now there are two of these, and ultimately they are bolted together. And that's what the whole casting looked like before it was admit, uh, fitted to the engine. So it's quite fantastic. I think beautifully cleared uh, photographs as well taken at the time. Really, really excellent. Speeding on then now. So just a quick view of the boiler. So um, Big Birth had two boilers. So she had a boiler that was built with her in, um, when she was built and that was boiler number 4482. And again, if I remember, I'll, I'll show you why that's relevant a bit later on. And then uh, in 1921, she had another boiler built as a spare. And the concept was uh, the, the thing that wears out most on steam engines is, is the boiler, because obviously it's receiving hot gases all the time. It's got water going in there. There's problems with water hardness. Um, also, the engine was working on an incline, so you've got constant uh, water level changes in the boiler. So the Big Bertha's boilers probably only used to last about two or three years and had to then to be swapped. And the idea was the engine would be taken to Derby, um, boiler taken off, other boiler put back on, a quick fettle of all the valve gear, and then she was sent back and she would probably only be out of traffic for a few weeks. Uh, whereas she'd had to wait to have the boiler um, overhaul properly, she would have been out of traffic for a long time and they would have been back to square one on the incline with, with lots of small engines pushing the trains up the incline. So uh, a few little features of the boiler here. So uh, here's the firebox as we're talking about. These top um, fittings are washouts. Uh, and you'll see those and later on I'm going to, and it's one of the ways you could tell the difference between Big Bertha because um, this boy, I think it was this boy that was modified later on and it had four washout plugs attached here as well. So you can actually tell from the photographs which boiler she's got on at any one time. And she finished service with this one on. This is, this is actually, this is the spare boiler. Um, so it's the other one that was modified, not this room now. It's the other one that was modified. Just looking at the boiler here, you can see they're actually fitting a tube here. These are one of the small tubes, as you can see, and that's so the hot gases in there pass through the tubes, um, heating up the water, and then pass up the chimney. And then you've got the top rows are called superheaters. So what happens with the steam is the, the, uh, the first set of boiler tubes sort of get the water hot and steamy. Uh, it then starts to come over from the dome. It then passes out through this hole here onto a, on a big casting, which hasn't been fitted yet. And then the steam is then passed through another series of little tubes that are inserted inside of these big tubes and the steam becomes superheated. So it actually becomes a gas rather than a vapor. Okay, so it's not like steam like we know coming out of the kettle. This is steam you can't see when, it, when it's going through here. It's just a very, very, very hot gas. And it's that gas that is then ultimately emitted to the cylinders, um, and it has a massive expansive capability and able to push the cylinders, push the uh, push the connecting rods and the and the wheels around. So there we go, quick anatomy. So that's the boiler without the smoke box on, uh, because they're still essentially they're still building it in the boiler shop at Derby Works in this picture. Can you see all here is a pile of tubes as well, uh, a lot of small tubes. They may all be destined for this this particular engine, but they may be a stock for some of those other boilers that you can see further away down down the uh, down the road. So, so this is a lovely photograph of uh, Big Bertha um, in her, what they call works gray. So it was very common um, in the early days. The, in fact, it's, it's not the early days, it, went, it even went right up to early British Railway days. I think it was quite common to, for the photographer to come to take a picture of this, this locomotive. And the most photogenic way of doing it was to present it in a, in a light gray, but actually lined out and, um, and lettered. Um, as though it was going to carry its main delivery. This is probably taken in front of a wall. So the, the other thing that the photographers used to do is they used to uh, literally white out 
uh, we, these days we can do it in Photoshop, can't we? <clears throat> but in those days it would all have been done by hand, meticulously done by hand. So we get the perfect picture of the engine standing against a white background in grey. And I think you'll agree, you'll agree that looks very, very attractive, but it never actually ran in that colour. So <clears throat> it probably works on the coach, but might be the, the best way of thinking it. And uh, ultimately she's going to end up painted black. That's what's going to happen when she's finished. So this picture would have been taken probably in 1919, probably a few weeks before she was due to be launched. Interesting things I note is that she doesn't have a smoke box number plate. She doesn't have a cast number plate here. It's painted on, which is interesting. Um, so clearly they hadn't cast it at that stage. Something very interesting here, you'll see the builder's plate just in between the, uh, these two wheels. That's, that builder's plate will say Midland Railway, built Derby, 1919. When the LMS took over in 1924, that plate was removed and it was replaced with an LMS plate. And you're going to see that again right at the end of the, uh, of the uh, presentation. Um, interesting things here, the tender um, actually is a recycled tender, would you believe? So the, the chassis, I believe, was built in about 1878. It's typical railways. The railways are the, are the, the best, or they always used to be, at repurposing things. They never wasted anything. They were absolutely amazing. And things would stay in use and repaired and kept working as, for as long as they possibly could. So, um, you know, to their credit. So this tender has got a new tank. But it's, uh, but it's the old chassis that it's on. I, I believe it's a Dealey chassis. Um, Dealey was one of the uh, other Midland Railway um, designers. So the famous names are Johnson, Kirtley, Dealey, and ultimately Fowler. Now I haven't come to that yet. So the engine itself uh, was designed at Derby under the auspices of uh, the chief mechanical engineer, Sir Henry Fowler, uh, who was a remarkable engineer. Um, but he was very much set in his ways in, in the kind of locomotives that he wanted. He had a particular design for, ax for axle boxes that, uh, that actually caught him, caught him out when he became CME of the, of the LMS uh, on, the, on grouping. Uh, but the actual design itself is generally attributed to one of his draftsmen, which was J.E. Anderson. Um, and most of the chief mechanical engineers had, had big teams of draftsmen working for them, producing these engines. And many of them would be the people that came up with the concepts uh, that he would then ultimately sanction or, uh, or ask to be uh, changed or, re or reviewed. So it's, a, it's no, notionally a Fowler engine. It actually has Fowler characteristics in, the, in its sort of shape. For those of you railway enthusiasts out there who know what a, what a Henry Fowler engine looks like, um, quite stocky, you know, very, they look powerful. Um, but with, with some inherent faults. Um, but, uh, but Fowler led to some amazing uh, locomotives design, not least of which um, you may remember some of you is the Royal Scot, um, that ultimately uh, was, a, was a mainstay of motive power on the, on the Midland Scottish and, and not actually on the Licking Incline, um, and then heavily rebuilt by Sir William A. Stanier uh, after that. But that's another story. So a couple of other features to note here, the chimney that's on here, you'll notice it's got a flat lip around the top. Um, ste uh, steam locomotive chimneys usually have what's called a capuchon on the top, which is a, a basically a, a, a lifted edge around the front. This one doesn't have that. This chimney is also recycled. It's recycled from another Midland Railway locomotive. Um, which I believe was a Paget design. I'm not actually very familiar with that, but ultimately that was replaced with a Stania chimney that has a little capuchon on it. And uh, if I remember, I'll try and point them out a bit later on. Uh, also, you'll notice um, she has two sets of what are called ram's bottom safety valves. Um, the main spring is in the middle. These safety valves maintain the boiler pressure at 180 pounds per square inch. And uh, when, the, when the pressure goes up, as it, as it does when water has been heated and heated, um, those safety valves start to what called lift. And that's when you, uh, you see the, the, the plume of white steam um, rising from the, from the safety valves. Ultimately, in time, those safety valves proved to be uh, inefficient and other versions came in and the ones that she ended up with were for what are called Ross Pop safety valves. <laughs> and again, I'll point those out. So the boiler we see here is boiler 4482. Um, it's got the three washouts at the top, but later on this boiler becomes modified and has these extra washouts, which we'll, we will see in some photographs uh, running along there. And that's how we can tell which boiler is on at any one time. Final thing to point out, a bit of memorabilia, which I don't have, unfortunately, you'll see there's a whistle there. Now that whistle is owned by Dennis Norton and sits in the Dennis Norton Rowing Museum. And uh, when it's open, you can still go and see it. And it's proudly stamped 2290 and, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic thing for the, uh, for the town to still have Big Bertha's uh, Hooter. And imagine how often that rang out across the, uh, the town all those years ago. 
Other few little things to point out. We've got some steam sanders down here onto the driving the driving wheels. Um, we've we've got square bearings uh, on the on the two on this on this main leading bearing. Um, we've got these little uh, catches there, which are to to knock any debris off the track that may have to be around occasionally. It can happen. Um, you'll notice here there are these two rods. Now, I don't know if you've ever, ever looked at a very large lorry. There's, there are some lorries out there that have got sort of long, rather long noses, and they'll often have these rods. They are marker rods, because when you look from the cab, you can imagine the driver trying to push the locomotive up behind the train. That's a long way. It's about 60 odd feet. Um, so it's a long way to uh, to say uh, the, the risk is you're going to run very quickly to the back of the train you're trying to uh, what, what's called buffer up behind so these rods are uh, they're like telltales they they give the eye something to focus on and uh, and, and able to relate the uh, end of the locomotive to the object that they're trying to connect with uh, a couple of other things here this is the lubricator here so it's a mechanical lubricator uh, which has been driven by um, a linkage and uh, that feeds oil uh, under pressure to uh, all the bearings but not unfortunately to the coupling rods so a, a big job for any engine man would be going around and doing an oil up uh, so all of these points had to be oiled separately around here and, and basically the, um, the mechanical lubricator is mainly oiling the, um, the bearings that are actually on the axles um, final thing to point out of, of interest to these are the, the two sand boxes. So that's where the sand would have been put in they, to, to get traction on the rail. You can imagine steel on steel, very hard to get a grip sometimes. Um, basically, um, uh, sand is, is blasted onto the track and that helps give a little bit more adhesion. So you can see here she's got two sand blasters onto her middle axle, which is the driving axle. That's where all the most all the force is happening. All of the four cylinders are driving that particular wheel, and then the loads are then being transmitted across along the other other remaining four axles, um, and then she's also got one on the front as well. So so she had to have a good grip, if you can imagine, to push trains of the sort of loads that she would have been working on up the Licky Incline. I'm going to show another photograph now from the other side. This is important. Now, this is quite an interesting photograph. Um, the reason I'm showing it mainly, though, is because you'll notice down this side, there is no obstructions. There is, there's nothing in the way, because later on, you're going to see there will be something in the way. This is the only photograph I can actually find easily um, with the, um, with, without this particular attachment. So when the engine was built, she was fitted with steam reversing gear. Uh, I'm not going to go into the complications of how steam engines work, but basically they can go forwards and backwards. And the way they do that is by changing the way the, the steam valves operate and the, um, the, the driver to control the steam admission to the cylinders, uh, it's for going forwards and backwards, um, has a controller. And in the, in the early days, she was fitted with a steam valve, but actually the drivers found it was very difficult to use. It was very jumpy. Um, it was causing them to, to, to buffer up too hard to the backs of the trains. So in, uh, in, in the 1920s, you'll see emerging down here a large bar that we're going to see in a bit. And that bar is a mechanical connector from the cab to the, uh, to the steam, steam valves to, uh, to control them. Uh, this is an interesting photograph as well. Um, within the first year of her life, she was trial fitted for oil firing. And you can see on here, there's a big drum in the back of her tender. And, and so, you know, oil firing was, was, was being tried right at the early part of the 20th century. So it's not, oil isn't, isn't the, the great modern thing that we think of. It's been around for a very, very long time. Um, the answer with oil firing is it can create really, really concentrated, massive temperatures in the firebox, and it can actually lead to, to real problems with maintenance. Um, as well as at the time, oil was probably still quite expensive. Um, apparently oil firing was tried twice, um, 1920 and then 1924-25 in the miners' strike. So when coal looked like it was getting short, uh, they tried it again. But, but uh, she spent most of her life working as a, as a coal-fired engine. And the other thing to point out is the, um, is the lamp on the front. Now, um, clearly these engines worked 24 hours a day. So um, she would have been working as much in the dark as in the daylight. And you can imagine trying to, uh, in those days, it would have been even darker. We wouldn't have had all the light pollution that we have now. So nights would have been very dark, very black. So trying to um, buffer up behind a, a train would have been really tricky. So in 1920, she was fitted with a, with a light um, driven by a steam generator. Um, which illuminated the whole back of the, uh, of, the, of the train so the driver could not only use his, uh, his little um, sight irons, but he could also see with the light. Now, you might be interested to know that the, um, the engine 
itself costs £7,209 to build and, and its tender costs £1,249 to build and the lamp cost a princely sum of 79 quid. So uh, <laughs> a bargain, but of course in today's prices that would have been um, you know, very high hundreds the, uh, for the lamp. So um, that was quite a big investment and the railways were quite frugal. If they could avoid spending money they would. So this, this was obviously very much needed. I'll just point out here this beautiful signal gantry here. These are Midland Railway signal arms, as you can see, and they're lower quadrant. The interesting one here is that, um, I can't resist being a bit nerdy. Um, these, in, if you go on the uh, Seven Valley Railway, for instance, you'll notice that the, the, the signal arms with the flat end are usually red, and the ones with the fish tail cutting them are usually yellow. But in the, in the early period of the, of the Midland Railway, actually right, right through probably to near grouping, the, the signal arms were actually red. Even the caution arms were red, not yellow. So it's quite interesting. It's the first time I've noticed that on this picture. Okay, so this is the grand launch of Big Bertha. She uh, turned her first wheel in anger uh, on the 1st of uh, January 1920. Um, as far as I know, it wasn't a bank holiday in those days. So they would just, just have been a normal working day for her. So this is actually a picture taken on her first day, taken by Hugh Castleley, one of the one of the country's leading photographers. Some of the photographs you're going to see today are, are Castleley pictures. Um, and you know, what, what a fantastic thing to see. And if you go to Derby now on the train, you can still see the big clock tower, which is there, and you can still see this big building here, which of course is now Derby um, University. But there we are, there we have Big Bertha on her first outing, uh, let loose in anger. And you can see that she is now black, painted all over in black. Uh, she's got a number plate. She's got the Midland Railway crest on her cab side, and she's carrying the number 2290, which she carried right through until 1947. Um, there we go. So. Now she became a bit of an icon uh, very, very quickly because of this. So she had uh, playing cards uh, with her on, and, and this is a, a, um, a, po a collector's postcard with her on. Um, she had uh, matchbox sets with, with her on, so she, she, she certainly made her mark. And people used to travel from all over the world to come and see this locomotive work. So, you know, we, sh we shouldn't underestimate the, the wonderful piece of engineering that we're, we're party to here in Bromsgrove. Something I've just noticed here, there's an extra sandbox on here. I've never noticed that before. So uh, obviously um, they needed to add something else to, to get the sand feeds to those front sanders. Uh, and I started my uh, presentation, if you remember, with that lovely Midland Railway uh, 222, or otherwise known as, a, sorry, 422, otherwise known as a spinner, um, pulling some lovely uh, Midland Railway cluster coaches. Well, Big Bertha wasn't only built to push freight trains up the incline, she was also built to put passenger trains. So you can see here we've, we've got a fairly lengthy train. That will be a very heavy train because these coaches were heavy. They were made of very solid, solid oaks and, uh, and teaks and sitting on very, very heavy bogey frames. Um, so that would have been a heavy train. Uh, it looks like the small engine, as I said at the early beginning, is at the front and then Big Bertha at the back, completely dwarfing anything else that, uh, that you can see there. I think it's probably a good time just to mention a few other statistics while I'm at it. So for the engineers amongst you, she had an attractive effort of 43,315 pounds. And that was, that was the, the most powerful engine until I think the LMS Duchesses came along. So um, which were the big sort of express engines that the, the London and Scottish Railway introduced um, for their crack services. But of course, she only had small driving wheels. So she was all power, um, but couldn't actually travel that fast. Uh, her wheels were four foot seven and a half inch diameter. I uh, thought you'd like to know that. Her, um, her overall length um, from the buffers, this is includes the tender, is actually 61 feet and five eighths of an inch. Seems phenomenally accurate to me. Um, and so um, I, was, I was probably wrong when I said a 60 foot look, it's about more like a, a 45 foot look from the cab, but that's still a hell of a long way to try and see when you're trying to buffer up behind somebody. Um, the engine itself weighed 73 tonnes and 30 hundredweights and her tender weighed 31 tonnes, 11 hundredweights. So overall, um, over 105 tonnes. So that's a very, very heavy locomotive. So you can imagine um, you need a pretty good permanent way and infrastructure to, uh, to cope with that. I'm gonna point something else out interesting here, which I keep seeing this fantastic. Can you see this um, pipeline running down the side of the line here? Now, um, just after, just before Vigo, this is, this is the Vigo rest home, about two thirds of the way up, there was a, a cutting with a, um, with a, um, 
uh, like a spring and they collected water from there and the water was piped all the way down the incline and then was taken was actually used for watering the engines um, because it was apparently good good clean spring water so that's a, an interesting fact i actually found a piece of that pipe when we uh, when i lived at uh, on the uh, ogles estate which had been uh, obviously discarded during a permanent way position so there we have big bertha pushing a, a wonderful midland railway train up the incline probably in her first year of service i would have thought there's another photograph of her now with the the oil tanks at the back as you can see um which uh, which is quite a rare Pope photograph, there aren't many. And again, she's behind a, a passenger train about to take it up there. There's a goods train waiting there and signing. So one of the other smaller engines will be taken on that load shortly. I'm trying to think of any other stats. Oh yes, so um, I, I shall say the, the how many miles she did until the end. So I'll try and come back to that. Um, I thought I'd include this picture because this is uh, a very early uh, picture in her life. Uh, if you remember the um, Midland Railway only existed until 1923. So this is taken in the first three years and this is her waiting at the top of the incline um, ready to descend the, the Licky Bank having pushed the train all the way up and then then uh, and then then come away. And um, it, you, those of you that are interested in rails will know that most trains at the time were, were all uh, braked by having a, a, a tender at the end. Um, and each wagon had its own handbrake. And to go down the incline, uh, all of the train, all the, all the wagons particularly had to be individually braked. The, um, the coaches were vacuum braked, but the wagons weren't. So this would have been the hut where the, um, the shunters would have, been, would have been based. And they, their operation would have been to what's called pin down brakes. And I always remember, even when I was young, there was still a pin down brake sign still left as a heritage at the top of the incline, uh, which is now long gone. Um, saying that no freight was allowed to proceed down the incline without all brakes having been pinned down beforehand. So in terms of the engine itself, you'll notice here she doesn't have the lamp. That's, that's the what I was going to say. So this really puts her within the first six months of her operating life. So this is this is possibly a photograph of her on, on test. Um, and I noticed there's quite a lot of pipe work on here. Now, I think that was something to do with the testing that was going on. So they're interesting stuff. You, you don't notice these things as you have a look more closely. So, um, and also she, later on in life, she gains a really nice cover over the front of these cylinders, as you'll see. So she has a slightly more elegant front end uh, a bit later on into her life. Uh, in fact, there we go. So this is her again, without the lamp, but with the nice covers on. <laughs> so I, I'm convinced these two pictures are probably taken during initial testing on the Licky Incline. So uh, quite quite fantastic to see that. So um, she went into uh, Midland Railway service uh, in 1920. As I said, in 1924, the Midland Railway was merged into the London Midland and Scottish Railway, uh, and all the locomotives were 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 repainted. Were re she wasn't pre-painted straight away, so this was a couple of years in. Um, but you can see now that she has an LMS livery, and she's got two two nine out. Now the BDI amongst you will notice on the tender. Can you see that two and a two? So that's the old 2290 from the Midland Railway, all painted out. And she's now had a number transplanted onto the cab side. In the old days, that would have been the Midland Railway crest. She's now got the number on the cab side and she's got the, uh, the tender letters. Now, the other interesting thing that's happened, if I just take you back, um, is you'll notice the tender had a much higher tender sheet at this point, but now it's cut down. Now, the reason that is cut down is because the engine was always cold uh, at Bromsgrove in the um, into at the yard at the Aston Fields, I think it's, I can't remember the bridge, but it's the one down by the Garrington's. So the railway bridge by the Garrington's, there was a, a short siding with a with a coaling stage. We're going to see that in a minute. And she was always hand cold. So uh, on, a, on many other parts of the railway system, they, they had coaling machines to actually put the coal into the tender, but she had to be hand cold. She held uh, two and a half tons of coal in her tender. So you can imagine every day having to probably have that filled. Uh, and more by hand and the uh, the coal the 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 guys doing it found that they could not actually get the coal over the top of the uh, over the sheet so it was um the tender sides were cut down to enable that to happen so um, it was also apparently done for visibility but I, i'm pretty confident it was more about the uh, cutting down than about the coaling um so there we go that's the interesting detail um, so she's now got her lamp fitted. You'll notice it's a completely clear and open light, and um, but she's still looking neat and tidy. This is clearly after repaint. I wouldn't mind betting this is actually taken at Derby Works again with the the background um, painted out. Um, 
in later life, she gets starts to get a bit more tired and sorry. Still 2290. And uh, this would have been some local maintenance probably done at Bromsgrove in the, in the wagon yard. They had some sh what are called shear legs at uh, Bromsgrove. So they were able to, uh, to lift engines up and remove wheels. And so she's, she's sitting here now, and this is the driving axle. So I would imagine that's been taken away for some work to be done on what are called the axle journals where the, uh, the conrods connect onto the, onto the wheels um, and probably the bearing wear as well. So uh, in fact, I can see that the bearing is completely gone and there's no spring on there either. So it's probably been taken out and, and probably taken off to Derby. Um, interesting picture here. You'll notice that she's now got the rust pop valves. If you remember, I think on this picture, look, she's still got the, uh, the ram's bottom ones, but now she's fitted with these, these modern valves. Uh, it's still the original boiler though. So um, uh, actually it might not be thinking about it. Anyway, but um, that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, but you can see she's been modified at this point now. Um, now this is what she looks like when she gets into British Railways condition. So in 1948, uh, 1st of January 1948, uh, the railway system was nationalised uh, and all locomotives were, were, so, were, all the railways were taken into British Railways ownership. And um, she, so in this picture here, she's probably been running for a little while since her repaint because she's looking quite grubby. Um, and she's got what they call the Cycling Lion British Railways uh, crest on her tender. She's carrying the new number 58100. So you can see here it's 2290. And now 58100. In between becoming 2290 to 58100, she had an extra two added in front of the number. I do have a photograph of that, but I'm not included in the pack. So she was for briefly in 1947, 22290. And the reason for that was uh, the LMS were introducing in a new fleet of tank engines and, uh, and it would have conflicted with that particular number. Um, so hence the change. So 22290 and then ultimately she becomes uh, 58100. So she's looking grubby. Interesting thing to look at here, you can see that the, the lamp, which was very open and clear in that previous LMS picture, is now all blacked off apart from a, uh, a small circle in the middle. That is because the lamp um, in the war had to be, black, had to be blacked out. Uh, and so in, the, in that time she would have cab sheets all around when she was operating. But the lamp, they still needed the lamp to be able to operate. So they reduced it to a small beam. And after the war, it wasn't changed. And that's exactly how she finished uh, with this particular lamp with the, um, the, whole, the main case, the, sorry, the main circumference blacked out with just a small um, light in the middle. Um, I can offer you an interesting snippet, which I picked up uh, reading for this. Apparently the drivers at night uh, would deliberately turn the light off once they'd buffered up. Because uh, if they left it on, uh, they felt it reminded the driver at the front of the, on the main locomotive um, that they were there and he wouldn't try as hard. And um, the, 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 the drivers had a tendency, because it was a big engine um, when they came in to, uh, to have a banker, they thought they could take it easy at the incline and leave it to Big Bertha to push it all the way up. And of course it would be slower and more inefficient and they, they, the, the driving crews would actually get penalised for it. So um, they would turn it off just to, uh, to remind the driver that he still had to do a lot of work up at the front um, and not rely entirely on Big Bertha for doing all the work. I've got another little snippet to point out to you here. Just here you can see the steam generator. That is the steam generator that powered the lamp. So, uh, and that was probably the original fitting that was provided in 1920, the one that cost 79 quid. I thought I would just include this, some pictures of Big Bertha at work now. Um, now these two small engines here, these are actually uh, London Midland Scottish Railway uh, 060 locomotives, they're called uh, Jinties. Um, and um, obviously Big Bertha couldn't push absolutely every train up this incline because the, there'll be far more trains coming than, uh, than, than they, they could cope with. So there still was a fleet of these tank engines. And I've got a really amusing picture in a minute of them all coming down the bank actually having all irrespectively pushed the various trains up the incline. So Big Bertha was not the only engine doing the banking. I think that's, that's fair, fair to say, but, uh, but clearly she was used for the heavier freights and the, and the heavier passenger trains when they were needed. So one thing I haven't explained at the moment is that when, um, when, when a banking operation takes place, um, the banking engine, which is the pushing engine, the one that comes up at the back, the main, the main train comes in, comes to a, comes to a halt, um, then signals to the banking engine that it's okay to now come and buffer up. Banking engine then will come and uh, gently 
buffer up behind the train. Uh, we'll give a few hoots or crows, as they were called. And so uh, that's why I was saying about Big Bertha's uh, Hooter sort of being very famous across the whole of Bromsgrove because it would have been heard so many times uh, in her time that, um, that, that everybody would have come to have known it. And, and then the train would then move away with the engine just pushing gently behind and would probably not do any pushing at all until the train had started to actually climb the bank. And then it was a skillful operation to, to gradually um, take up the power, take up the load, possibly anything up to half the length of the train would be being pushed while the other half was being pulled. And as the engine got to the top of the incline at, uh, at Blackwell, uh, again, the drivers would exchange hoots. The, the drivers and the lead engine would say, right, we're OK now, we've got control. And then the, uh, the banking engines would then just gently drop away. Uh, and they had a very sleek system at the top of the leaky incline, controlled from Blackwell signal box, which enabled the engines to almost just keep running and then run into their own um, holding bay before they were allowed to come and run back down the incline. So it was a very, very finely timed operation. The banking was undertaken by a fantastic uh, range of crews uh, who were all based down at Bromsgrove, um, actually near to that coaling stage that I've, I'm going to show you a little picture of later on. And, um, and it was a 24-7 operation. So... Uh, you know, um, night in, day in, day out, Christmas day, all, all year round, there would always have been a crew there ready to go and push the heavy trains up the Licky Incline. Here's another nice photograph here. I like this one. I think this, um, I think this is just coming out of Bromsgrove. I might be wrong here. So the historians amongst you will know which building that is. So perhaps we could pick that one off in a little bit. Um, but then there's Big Bertha behind a goods train. And I explained a bit earlier on, didn't I, about them being... Um, uh, handbrake, so you can see the little handbrake levers on the wagons here, and this is the brake van at the back, uh, in which there would be a guard. The guard was responsible for making sure that the train stayed whole <coughs> throughout the journey, and, and also for uh, overseeing things like the pinning down brakes operations. Um, in this picture, you can see that the lamp is not filled in, so this is obviously pre-war. Uh, this photograph, so it's probably an LMS, and they're LMS wagons, so it's, a, it's an LMS picture pre-war. I thought I'd include this one here. You can see there are one, two, three, four, five, six tank engines in that picture. So what's happened is there's been a whole series of trains that have gone up one after the other. Uh, and it hasn't been possible for the tank engines to come back down because of the trains coming back down the incline. Um, this is inside Bromsgrove Station. So um, they've had to wait their turn. And ultimately we've got six of them all, or a couple of them and coming down the incline, which would be something to see. This, of course, is the old Bromsgrove station, um, which had three tracks through it, as you can see. Um, that's right, three tracks through it. Um, this track at the, for the down platform was deliberately off the main line in case there were any runaways. So that was there to protect um, any trains that were stationary in this platform here. There's the uh, the bridge um, at Bromsgrove station. And I, I guess, and there's the, the famous, um, uh, locomotive engine, so the engine, that's right, the locomotive engineer's house. Um, and you can just see the, um, the little walkway um, that, that was there for them to stand on, which is now, which now gr graces the front of Dennis Norton's museum. Um, that was a beautiful bridge. I, I was quite sad when they took that away, actually. It's such a shame. And it was taken out, I think, it was way pre-electrification when it came out, but, uh, but it was such a shame. I used to like Bromsgrove Station, though, the fact you could stand at the end of it and look right the way up the incline and just imagine what it was going to be like for those engines trying to work their way all the way up. Here's a lovely photograph uh, taken in British Rail days, um, part way up the incline. I'd love to know where that is. If It, it could be somewhere near Vigo. I'm not sure that it is, though, because of the incline. I've got a feeling, I've, of, I've often wondered whether this actually is the Oakwell's estate. Um, but I don't know. Somebody might, on the call might know. Actually, there's a road here. No, it isn't. No, this is this is um, this is uh, this is the um, Pikes Pool Lane, isn't it? That's right. So this is just be, just after it's crossed over Pikes Pool Lane Bridge um, before before she climbs higher. Um, nice picture. I think that's such a sort of sylvan scene that I love, I love that picture. I've got another one coming up soon with uh, with with her on the back of a, of a passenger train. And that sort of really brings home the sort of rural aspects of Bromsgrove at the time, doesn't it? Now, this is an interesting picture, which um, I will share with you. Now, Big Bertha had several um, uh, challenges during her life in terms of whether she should be the only engine in the banks or whether she should be supplemented. Um, and she even went away to uh, Wellingborough uh, in the 1920s to be trialled. I think it was 1924 to be trialled as, as a heavy freight engine to see whether um, they could actually use this concept for powering freight trains 
uh, the big heavy coal trains um, through Bedfordshire. Um, but she didn't prove to be very successful, partly because of speed, partly because of um, sort of frailties with her bearings um, and being overworked. Um, so ironically, her visit there did preempt the introduction of the London and the Scottish Railway Garrett class locomotive. And this engine here we can see here is a London and Northeastern Railway Garrett, which is basically one boiler with two engines. And uh, in the 1950s, um, British Rail experimented by bringing the, the London and Northeastern Railway Garrett, there was only one, um, to, to, to trial on the Licking Incline. And that wasn't very successful, but this is a very, very rare picture of Big Bertha and the Garrett. You can imagine the power there, pushing this big freight train up the incline, uh, which is which is something to behold, isn't it? Now, um, I'm going to share a, a fond memory now. So I did say to you earlier on, didn't I, that uh, Big Bertha was, uh, was an icon and people came from all over the world to come and see her. Um, we're going to hear in a few seconds a little story I'm going to read uh, to you from people coming from New Zealand. So um, when I was doing the research for um, the 2006 exhibition, uh, I put out a call um, with, with the society and I had a lovely family from um, uh, Fairfield get in touch with me um, because their, her father used to be a fireman on the, on the Viking Klein and his name was, uh, was Roy Cummings. <clears throat> and she said she got a photograph of, of him. I'm going to show that picture in a minute. And so I went to their house and um, we shared some, some nice stories and um, and I said, well, can I borrow the picture? So she said, well, uh, sorry. So on the, on the wall, I've, I've jumped myself. Uh, on the wall, there was a lovely photograph of her dad on the footplate of Big Bertha. So that's fantastic. And you're going to see that in a minute. And I, and I said to her, well, can I just possibly borrow the picture so that I can scan it and I'll bring, I'll bring it back to you. So uh, she took the frame down and she took the picture out. And to our absolute delight, this letter was, was tucked away behind the picture. And she had no idea this letter was there. So this was a letter written by uh, a guy called A.C. Lamb uh, to, to uh, Roy, uh, basically just saying, thank you for allowing me to, to travel with you on the footplate. Uh, and I've subsequently learned um, that uh, this was really common. People were coming from all over the country and all over the world to, to cadger or to uh, bunk Big Bertha, as they call it, and have a, have a ride on the, on the footplate. And uh, so I thought this is such a lovely memory. Um, I thought I'd just share that with you. And, and very often these people would write back to them and they would often send them gifts as well. So, um, um, you know, I think it's a lovely thing. As you can see, this gentleman's come from Hartlepool down just to go and travel on Big Bertha in 1954. At that stage, it, the rumours were probably starting to, uh, to, to propagate that uh, she was going to be scrapped. So I think probably there were more people coming to see her at that stage. Um, but I think it's a beautiful, beautiful little letter. And uh, this is Roy uh, on his way to work. I thought I'd share that with you. And then uh, this is him on the footplate. Uh, that's him there. So he was the fireman on Big Bertha. Now, this is an interesting picture. If this picture is taken in front of the coaling stage that I referred to you uh, referred to earlier, which is down next to the Garrington site. And, and the, the mess hut here with the little lamps is where all the crews were based. So uh, banking duties <clears throat> would start by signing on. Um, and then the, the crews would then be allocated to go and work on the locomotive and, and take it forward. Um, I also included this picture because it's one of the only ones I got of the of the right hand side. And if you remember right at the start, I was talking to you about the engine not having this, this intrusion in front of this, this rod. So this is the rod that was introduced in the 1920s to, uh, to mechanically control the valve gear uh, in that steam chest rather than the steam operating one that uh, she had originally. Now, there's a, there was a lovely book um, printed a few years ago, which I, I know, so I think it sold out very, very quickly by Pat Wallace, who was one of the Big Bertha drivers uh, and who will be known to many of you on this call now. Um, I, th I think sadly he's passed away now, but, um, but the book is, is absolutely glorious. And um, there's one lovely little section in it, which I would like to read. So it might take a few minutes. I don't know how we're doing for time, but I'm going to do it anyway, because <laughs> I just think it's nice. And I'm going to, I'm going to describe to you, um, Pat, uh, Pat's recollection of some people coming to join him on the, the Licky Incline. And I'm going to try and scroll through the photographs that I've, that I've compiled for you here uh, to help us do that. So um, he starts off by saying, so it's a footplate, footplate ride up the bank. Those of you that have got this book, it's page 61. So uh, have a look. So, um, so this, is, this is Pat talking. We used to get a lot of visitors down at the south, many of them requesting a cab ride. Down at the south, he means the south yard by the south signal box. Um, some of these visits were official, but most of them not. 
And one of the ones he recollects is a visit from some people from Australia and New Zealand coming to join them on the footplate. Now they were not supposed to take them on the footplate and, uh, and the railways operated with an inspection system. So there would have been mobile inspectors going around sort of checking up on the drivers and making sure they were doing things right. So when they took um, people on the cabs, they were taking quite a bit of a risk actually, but they did it because they just really appreciated the fact that they were so interested in what they were doing. So he goes on to say, the New Zealanders were dental surgeons and were very keen to fire the engine. So they rolled their sleeves up and got stuck in. They shouldn't have been doing that either, really. Not all drivers would welcome people on the footplate, even though there was a chance of some money or a packet of cigarettes being thrust in your hand. But I gave many rides, even though it was against the rules. Sundays were probably the best days for this. So if you haven't already been at the bank with me, perhaps you would like to take a trip now. And that's what I'm going to do. So if you were going to bunk the engine, your choice would be Big Bertha. And um, so that's what people wanted to come. They wouldn't want to go up in one of those little ginties. They wanted to come and see the real McCoy. Um, 58100 would be your choice. And, and he's going to take us back to the 8th of April, 1956, which was a Sunday. And um, he says, your timing is good, as there has been talk in the cabin that the biggin is nearing the end of its days and may not return from Derby after its next visit. Turn 19, because all the turns had a number, and that's the driving turn, is the 8.05 a.m. bank job on 58100, and I had booked on with my mate Brian Perkins. Again, that's a name that some of you are going to know, I imagine. This was my 72nd driving turn. So as you step from the coal state onto your engine, you will be struck by the smell of steam and oil and the sound of sizzling as water dripped from a minor leak onto the drip tray. You will also notice the heat from the fire even though my mate has not got it hot yet. My diary doesn't record the state of the fire, but let us assume we have lumped it, that means piled it up, uh, as there are a number of extra freights due up today and we are expecting to be busy. To lump the fire, I would have helped my mate throw as many big lumps in as we possibly could. And this is a, a photograph of the cab of Big Bertha taken by, um, I think Barry Troth, I think, took this photograph, I, I might have got it wrong, so. Uh, Apologise. And um, you can see the two spectacle plates here. That's that's the, the viewing part of the engine. It's looking down the boiler. Um, you've got all the various gauges. I'm not going to spend time and explain them to you, but this is a super diagram uh, with every single thing annotated. A couple of things I'm going to point out. This one here, 18, you'll see is the driver's leg shield. That's because when the driver was sitting, uh, driving the, or rather standing, they didn't sit there was, when he was driving standing, the heat from the fire, particularly when the firebox was open while the fireman was stoking it, would have been very, very intense on his legs. So uh, he had a, a, had a fire guard, if you like. Interesting thing that you'll also like to know is the whistle. There's the little whistle, which um, in West Great Western engines is often, is often a chain operated one, but in the Midland ones, it was a lever. Um, this is the, um, the mechanical operating uh, system for the valve gear. So basically the driver rotates that and it pushes the valve gear forward or backwards to, to help the engine go forward or backwards. Uh, and then the other one that I thought was really nice, so sweet, is 20, and that's the coat hook. So that's uh, somewhere for the fireman to, to sling his coat when he's, uh, when he's working really hard. You've also got the gauge glasses here, which is uh, keeping an eye on the water level in the boiler. Uh, and obviously you've got main, main steam pressure gauge up there, which is really important. So there we are. That's, uh, that's what uh, the visitor would have seen. Um, so now as you sit down on the fireman's seat, an express runs by. Oh, sorry, I've, I've jumped the gun. So this is a quick view before you say you've gone on the fire. You've seen the fire. You've seen the back head. Uh, you've seen the fire. The, uh, the tender is, is stoked up good and high. Um, she's raising steam. There's the feathering of the safety valves I mentioned to you earlier on. So she's got the steam up now. The guests are on the footplate. And in this particular story, of course, these two engines aren't there. So they're probably behind it. So she's ready to go off next. Uh, and she'll work her way up there and then back out to here and then back up onto the train. And this is where the story starts. So here's the express. So the express has arrived, and it's drawn to a halt. Um, these are mid, uh, LMS Stania coaches here, M2422, for the carriage enthusiasts. And this coach is in what's called carmine and cream livery. So in uh, LMS days, they would have been painted uh, car, uh, maroon or, or crimson lake. Uh, in the early days of British Railways, they were painted, um, it, it had several names, it had plum and spilt milk, uh, a plum colour, uh, carmine and cream was the one, so carmine and the cream was the actual official title for it. 
So now you've uh, you've gone onto the foot plate and you're now moving up behind the engine. So as you sit down on the fireman's seat, an express runs by on the main line, and with the steam brake on, Brian releases the handbrake and then opens the dampers as I put her into full forward gear. A shout from my mate tells me the dummy is off. Now the dummy is the, what's called the calling on arm. And I can show you a dummy there. On this big bracket here, you can see the tiny signal there. That's it. That is what you would call the dummy. And one there, they're calling on arms. Um, so they are allowing an engine to draw up even though the overall arm is on, is on stop. So the dummy's off, steam brake off, at, um, sorry, and with the steam brake off, a tug on the regulator gets us going out of the bank engine sidings and towards the rear of the train. As we do so, I close the cylinder drain cocks. That's the, uh, these are these things at the bottom which stop water accumulating in the cylinders and uh, can, can actually cause um, what's called a, a hydraulic action when the cylinder can actually blow the end of the, uh, of the cylinder cover off. So um, we don't want the drain cocks on because it's too much steam and the driver wouldn't be able to see the end of the train and would risk hitting it too quickly. So, and if it was dark, my mate would have switched the headlamp on by turning the steam valve to start the generator. But this is a daylight operation. As we buffer up to the rear of the train and wait for the train engine to reply to our whistle, you have time to look over my side of the engine. He's the fireman, remember, so he's on, he's on the side you can see now, to the extensive carriage and wagon sidings and a number of huts belonging to brakesmen and wheel tappers and on the other side to the coal sidings and the good shed built in 1898. After hearing the crow, cock a doodle -doo, that's, that's uh, the driver's nickname for the whistle, from the train engine, I open the regulator. Ah, right, okay, I've got this wrong now. So this is uh, Pat driving. I was, I was thinking I was getting my terminology wrong. So uh, Pat is actually on the other side of the engine. <laughs> that's the fireman, uh, which is why, he, of course, he could see the sidings and the, uh, and the loco shed. And on this side would have been the, the good shed up, up this side. So I've got to get that right, because if the people are there nodding and shaking their heads now, because I got that wrong. So, so Pat is driving the engine. It's a right-hand drive engine. He's sitting on the other side of the cab. So um, not too much power straight away as it was it's still possible to slip even with 10 driving wheels. It's such a powerful engine. Can you imagine that? All of that weight, 79 odd tons sitting on those wheels and, uh, and then pushing there and still be able to slip. It's quite, quite something. A glance at my watch shows it's 9.23 and I make a note in my book. That's important because we'll see how long it takes him to get up the incline. We're soon thundering past the station box and into the platform. There we go. So this isn't a freight, this isn't a passenger train, as you can see, but this is Big Bertha with another engine now. So this must have been a very heavy train passing the signal box. That's Bromsgrove signal box that used to sit uh, on the, um, what we would call the upside of the, of the station, the one that you would come to when you went down the drive to the tracks. Looking to the right, you'll see the engine shed and all the wagons and build, works buildings beyond. The sound bounces back from the platform buildings and the wall where there was once a bookstall before we pass the water column at the end of the platform and pass under St. Godswell's Bridge and get onto the bank, up through the cutting and speed settles down as we pass the, the up starter signal. <clears throat> so there we go, she's getting into her stride now. Um, she's, it's not the same coach as you can see, it's a different number, but it's, a, it's a, another um, LMS standing coach in Carmine and Cream. And there she's working hard with another train running down the bank there, as you can see. The blast from the chimney has livened the fire up nicely now, and we have plenty of steam as we pass under the Finstall Road Bridge and the old chapel and graveyard on the right. As we leave the cutting for an embankment, there are some bungalows on the right and the fields on the left where there used to be a lot of rabbits before myxomatosis struck. My mate had been looking out and gave me the nod that the automatics were off. Now, the automatics are the colour light signals. And, and I'm quite really pleased I managed to find a picture of one. Um, this is about, I, I definitely know this is opposite where the um, local estate is now, this signal. And that signal was still there until quite recently. It's only got replaced when the electrification happened. The same one you can see there. The, the, it, I, was, I was always fascinated by it. So a uh, very interesting uh, thing to see. So that's a quick view from the fireman's side. Uh, looking along the boiler and you can see there's the coaches uh, looking up the incline and that is what they call the automatics, an automatic colour light signal. Um, right, so, um, so we continue through open country with Caps Pidge Farm on the right, we then blast past Pikes Pool and pass over the catch points and past the small reservoir on the right which feeds the water columns at Bromsgrove and on we pan towards Vigo. That's the little reservoir I referred to a bit earlier on. 
this is a popular place for enthusiasts. Vigo still is, I think, isn't it? Um, as we head towards the, um, sorry, it's a popular place for enthusiasts, and there are a number there already this morning. So even on a Sunday morning at nine o'clock, the enthusiasts were out watching him take the big berth up the incline. As we head towards the distant signal for Blackwell, my mate puts both injectors on as the water level is now dropping, and we need it to uh, to towards we need the it to be fuller towards the top of the glass when we level out at the summit. So the injectors basically drive the water from the tender uh, into the boiler. Um, there's another nice photograph of her working hard now. This this is uh, working up towards passing Vigo. Um, and then this this is the uh, the old care home that used to be at Vigo, which which used to sort of dominate the whole whole uh, landscape. And that's that's this this that they're talking about now. On the, on the left is the convalescent home, a well known landmark. And on the right there is a line of poplar trees that sometimes causes a problem in the autumn, but not today. And we enter the cutting for the final part of the bank, past some more catch points and the Blackwell home signal, and we're through the station. And with no indication from the signalman that we are to cross by the box, I give a good push on past the goods yard and on, and on the left. With the blower on, I close the regulator and the train pulls away. If you remember, I said that they don't couple up to the trains, they pull back. And then this is Big Bertha having dropped off a train and, uh, and now um, going through her operations before she goes back down. You can see Blackwell signal box there. <clears throat> and that's the old Blackwell station, um, which of course is all long gone. As we come to a stand, both dummies come off. So if you remember, those are the dummy signals that I've referred to earlier. And we go straight through the banker siding and wait at the starter. And while we are waiting, I take the opportunity to note down the time we got to Blackwell, Blackwell 9.31. So it's taken them um, eight minutes to, to, to climb the incline, actually, which I think is quite quick, actually. We don't have long to wait. And after getting underway, I make a note in my book at the time, 9.34. We return at a steady speed down the bank using the steam brake and arriving back at Bromsgrove at 9.45. If they had some tankies behind them on the way, uh, they would have wound the tender handbrake on and the, the rear engine would have uh, had a bit of steam to keep us together. So that was important. So when you saw all those tank engines coming down in that other picture, they weren't coupled together. They were all loose and the engine in the front would have had the steam brake on um, to, to keep them all buffered up. Unusually, apparently there were two handbrakes on the big one. The other being on the engine, so she had, uh, so you had quite a lot on your hands. And then this was the first of five trips that day, one more passenger, and then three goods. I think it's a really lovely story, and it's a lovely, lovely book, and you can still get it on Amazon. I noticed this morning, so I would recommend you, uh, if you're interested, go and read it because it's full of lovely, lovely anecdotes like that. So into her very final days, um, she had a, a repaint, as you can see here. Um, this is beautiful. She's still got the, uh, the shielding, as you can see, within the, um, within the lamp. Um, she's got a lovely coat of gloss, uh, and she's now carrying her new number, 58100. And um, so the numbers she's carrying in her life were 2290, then 22290, and then 58100. Um, and, and looking absolutely marvellous, isn't she? I think it's fantastic. The, the, the care of the detail that you've got, it's all in black with what they call red straw lining on the cylinders and around the boiler. Um, just, just a beautiful engine to look at. And there's, there's the number, just to confirm. Now, all locomotives have engine record cards and um, a Big Bertha is no different. And these are all held at the National Railway Museum and they very kindly let me uh, look at them and. Uh, and scan them while I was down there back in 2006, which was fantastic. There's probably too much detail on here, but if any of you are really interested, I'd be more than happy uh, to a, a let you have this slide pack, but also if you're particularly interested in these, to let you have some copies of the uh, of the cards. You can see um, these were uh, these were originated in um, in um, 1919, 1920. Um, they've been overstamped now with the 58100 number because these are now in British Railways ownership. But you can still see the original build number down here, £7,200 for the low care, £1,200 for the tender. This, this card seems to be dated 1950. Now, apparently what happened after 1950, they stopped updating the record cards. Um, so on here, it says 724,967 miles. She did more than that. And I'm going to just cover what that is um, at the very end of the presentation in my kind of wrap up. Um, and in here, you've got all the sort of major repairs that she had. Uh, and, some, and some statistics. There will probably have been supplementary pages to these as well, but uh, they're still fascinating and always worth pouring over. I always enjoy it. So there was a separate engine, engine history card. There was a boiler engine 
uh, history card. And on here, you can see the two boilers, 4886 and 4395. Uh, and on this, if you look at it in details, it tells how and when they were swapped and what work was under, under, um, undertaken for them. Um, and then the final engine card is the um, one for the tender. So the tender itself had its own separate card. A very interesting one on here in red, we can see the locomotive was withdrawn 19th of May, 1956, but the tender wasn't withdrawn <coughs> until the 16th of June. 1956 and that's just typical railway speak they're probably thinking we can recycle this <laughs> um, but then ultimately they decided not to interestingly up here you can see some old numbers the 22290 2290 interestingly this hasn't been over stamped 58100 for some reason but uh, i don't know what the reason for that is <clears throat> and 1956 is there because that is the year she's withdrawn uh, very sad uh, facts, but um, you know, all things, all good things have to come to an end. She had 36, 37 years service, and uh, and she, she was a, a real icon. 7th of May 1956, she went. Um, and I, I still feel very sad that this locomotive was not preserved. <clears throat> it was completely innovative in its day. Um, it, it involved some really intricate engineering. Um, it was really slogged for most of its life. Um, nicely, because the drivers cared for it and looked after it, but she still had to work blooming hard. And, um, and then ultimately just, just cast aside and scrapped when she was really a real feat of engineering and ingenuity of man. So I, I still really regret that. It's a very sad, mo sad moment. So this is uh, her last picture of her complete. Now, actually, this was taken, uh, I believe, in, um, in August, I think, or September 1956, for the Derby Works Open Day. And what had actually happened is she'd been withdrawn and she'd had all her boiler cladding stripped off to, to remove all the asbestos because the, uh, the, the insulation around the boilers was asbestos. So they would strip it all out, getting her ready to be scrapped. Um, but then when the Open Day came up, they said, well, while, we, while she's still here, it's still in one piece, we might as well put it back together and, uh, and have her out there for people to look at. And, uh, and apparently she was one of the most popular exhibits there. So why on earth they didn't read into that message that the, the engine should be preserved, I don't know. Sadly though, you'll notice her number's gone and also uh, her light has gone. And uh, what actually happened was she was taken in to her, um, uh, to, be, to be decommissioned. Uh, and while she was there, the lamp was taken off and it was put onto a replacement locomotive, which was a British Railway Standard 9F which was a 2.10.0, so same 10-wheel arrangement, but with a fifth, two penny wheels at the front. But interestingly, only two cylinders, but more powerful and more efficient. So a more efficient boiler, more efficient steam arrangements and delivery of power to the wheels. Um, so although um, on paper, this was a more powerful engine, the, the 9Fs were, as they were came to be known, were, were more than capable of pushing some of these trains up the incline. And, uh, and that 9F was 92079, and that carried the lamp uh, for quite a number of years before she too was uh, was finally decommissioned. So that's quite sad. The next pictures are very sad. So this is her being taken to pieces. Um, all the boiler cladding has been removed. She's now been lifted off her wheels. <clears throat> Interesting, you can see how the wheels have rubbed the um, uh, the, the actual frame. The clearances are very very tiny, um, and, but because of the going around curves and things, the wheel still has to still has to be a sideways play. So there is still some minor rubbing that can take place between the wheels and the uh, and the chassis. Um, so all of all the features stripped off, um, all the valve gear gone. So so very sad. Um, I th I'm not sure whether that's a tender. It doesn't look like it actually. Tender with somewhere else. And this is even sadder now. This is the boiler being lifted away to be scrapped. And uh, those are the very last pictures of this locomotive uh, that exists. So uh, terribly sad. Sorry to keep saying it, but it is. So just to wrap up then, there's some, there is some lovely memorabilia knocking around. Um, so I'm pleased to tell you that the number plate 58100 still exists, as does the replacement builder's plate uh, that was produced by the LMS to replace the Midland one. <clears throat> the LMS were very corporate minded, as were the London Northeastern Railway. and. Um, of course, the Great Western didn't have this problem because the Great Western carried on into grouping and still stayed as the Great Western. But the LMS actually took all the number plate, all the builders' plates off all its locomotives that were built before 1924, and and badged them as LMS, which was kind of a publicity thing. Uh, I, I gather that this was prepared for the shed foreman at uh, at uh, Bromsgrove Works uh, for his retirement, and so it's the original number plate restored, and that and it's it's owned and, and held in careful custody at the Midland Railway Centre in uh, Butterley. 
uh, and they very kindly lent me this for the exhibition back in 2006. And um, had we been able to have a physical exhibition this year, they said I could have it again. So uh, I might be able to bring it. Um, this is the model of Big Bertha that you can see in the National Rail Museum. So it's a very detailed scale model um, based roughly on when she was built. Um, so um, it, it's a lovely model and it's actually mounted on a, on a plinth that is at one in 37. So <laughs> one in 37.7, so when you go and see it, the engine is point, slightly pointing uphill. Uh, at the moment, that's in um, in one of the um, in the the big area. That's I can't remember what they call it now. It's, it's essentially what is the, the storage area, but it's open to the public. <clears throat> and again, the National Rail Museum did actually give me permission to have this um, back in two thousand and six, but the insurance issues around it and transportation were just too difficult. Um, it is believed, and there may be people on this call that will know this, that it was built in Robsgrove. Um, so it is a local engine. So really, it ought to come back here. But um, anyway, it's a supermodel. And if you do happen to go to the National Rail Museum in York, I would encourage you to go and fish, look it out and see if you can find it. And this is a lovely uh, painting. Uh, Neville Billington is a good, good friend of mine and a, and a great supporter of all things history and railways in Bromsgrove, uh, particularly on the, uh, on the, um, the Scaife and Rutherford gravestones and, uh, and, and, and crews. Uh, in those terrible boiler explosions that happened in 1840. Um, this is a lovely photograph produced by uh, uh, Roy Wilson, uh, a picture produced by Roy Wilson. Um, it's, it's slightly inaccurate, I have to say, because it's, it's an LMS engine pushing a British Railways brake van. So uh, we, can't have to, we can't go into too much detail there, but um, all the same, it's still a, a powerful picture and it's, it really conveys the power of the locomotive working really hard, as you can see. One last glimpse of Big Bertha, and I've included this deliberately for a reason. So first of all, you'll see that she's standing on a siding next to a bridge. This is the uh, footbridge next to the Garrington site and the, and the new housing estate all around here. As you, as you know, it's all um, two or three storey houses. <clears throat> and this is the coaling stage. And you can see now if they were coaling from here, trying to get the coal into the tender, those higher cab sheets, sheets would have been difficult. And also you can see they probably would have obscured vision. But interestingly, she's buffered up against a Ginty 47305, and 47305 caused a lot of damage to 58100 when it ran into it, uh, I think in 1954, and, um, and she had to go to be repaired, heavily repaired, and they actually found that the front of the frames were heavily corroded, so they had to replace the front sections of the frames from the leading axle onwards. And, and it was from then on that she acquired these two, these slightly modified frames. If you remember right at the start, I said to you, you can see the, the, the gentle taper or the, the, the new frames that were added in um, were modified and they've also got lifting lugs in them now. So uh, obviously to help maintenance. So that's an interesting change there. You can still see the lamp still blacked out. Uh, I also mentioned, didn't I, the chimney, the capuchon, you can see that here, a little lip right at the front. When she was built, she didn't have that lip. And that's all about controlling the draft of, across the chimney when the engine's uh, working. Uh, and there is the whistle again, which you can find in Bromsgrove Museum. And onto the final slides now. Back in 2006, there still were quite a few people with us who uh, were familiar with the engine, had driven it or knew it. Uh, and I uh, created uh, what I call the role of honour. <clears throat> and I, I asked people to sign it and say there. Um, to, 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 if, I, I'm not sure whether all these people are alive or whether they were names of people that people put on there. Um, but for my sake of my friend, uh, Tony Woodward, I'm just going to point out here, we've got Jim uh, Woodward here. There you go, Tony, just for you, who was one of the first drivers uh, in 1920. Um, and uh, you know, so it's a fantastic to commemorate them. There's lots of names on there that I'm sure many of you will recognize um, from the past. And, uh, so sad that uh, they're probably not with us anymore. Um, I can't actually see Pat Wallace on there, actually. That's interesting. Anyway, don't mind. <laughs> don't look too hard. Finally, um, this is a, not a very good photograph for a deliberate reason. This is uh, the only photograph I could find taken from the bridge, looking down the engine onto the coaling stage. OK, so this is Big Bertha sitting there waiting to be cold. Uh, interesting detail, you can see Bromsgrove South signal box there. <clears throat> There's the two gantry signals I pointed out to you when I did the little story about going to the incline with the two dollies on them. And there used to be a turntable behind the, uh, the um, signal box, which is the, the, the turntable pit is still there uh, if you ever want to go and look. But the reason I've done this is because Big Bertha at rest, God bless her soul. And unfortunately, 
she's been replaced by a generator <laughs> uh, to uh, maintain the, uh, the electricity supply. Uh, it'll be a transformer, not a generator. Well, there probably is a backup generator as well. So uh, that's my tribute to Big Bertha. Gone but not forgotten. Very dear to my heart, dear to everybody's heart. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this journey. There are thousands more photographs I could have shared with you, um, but I, I hope I've picked the ones that kind of convey her in the best possible light. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Alistair. That was um, really wonderful.